The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. It's day two of the Civility Wars, and I need to emphasize to you how asymmetrical this fight actually is. We have already lost, and we have lost because we have allowed Republicans, conservatives, and generally the people in power, more so than just a particular ideology, the people who are in power and those who benefit from that power, we have allowed them to define the parameters of our debate. We have allowed them to create the framing. We have allowed them to set the Overton window, whichever way helps you to understand this best. But we have allowed them to dictate the rules of engagement to us. Rules of engagement that they don't engage, that they don't follow themselves. And th- we see it so clearly right now in the discussion of how we must be civil in our discourse and that we must be civil in our our disagreement with conservatives. And the fact that right now on a news station across this country, we have people who will elevate their concerns about our civility to be a story, an issue that rivals what's happening at our borders, what's happening with the separation of children from asylum seekers, what is happening in terms of the president of the United States violating the Constitution, undermining the due process that is afforded to every person whose feet touch these shores. The fact that the media would elevate their concerns with our incivility to the level of what Donald Trump is actually doing to this country and doing to human rights. That in itself is appalling and a problem. That is the problem. That is how they are able to control the discourse. That is how they are able to keep us in this asymmetrical political conflict. Where we are forever being held to a standard of civility while Donald Trump is not even held to the standard of constitutionality. And then to have the media begin this entire conversation about civility and to lecture us about civility in the era of Trump. When when and and then to interpret our our justified anger, our righteous indignation to interpret it as hatred when they have rarely, if ever applied that label to Republicans, to conservatives who have demonstrated that the if any if there's anything in our national discourse that is based on hatred, it is the treatment of immigrants by this administration and the motivation behind that treatment. And yet the label of hatred has only been applied to us who have shown anger in reaction to what this administration is doing. They didn't talk about hatred until Maxine Waters, the 79 year old grandmother, congresswoman, black woman, until she got out and had the nerve to say that we need to challenge and, 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 and harass this administration anywhere we see them. Then they th- started talking about hatred. We're not see. Not that I have to explain this to you, but I will put it on the record. Even if she said the word harass. We're not harassing them because of who they are. We are harassing them because of what they are doing to other people. What they are doing to an entire class of people. We are, we are, we should protest them anywhere we see them. Because what they are doing is reprehensible. What they are doing is unacceptable. And we who are of good conscience cannot stand by and allow this to happen. We do not have any power. We are quite frankly, to a certain extent, we are powerless in terms of the federal government and our ability to stop what this man is doing. And so we like the article. um, We have a crisis of democracy in The Washington Post. The author said that we uh, on the left, we have had to use we have had to use this cultural pressure because this is all we have left. And yet we have an overabundance of voices in the media from CNN to MSNBC to, to, of course, Fox News. I don't even consider them. But we have an overabundance of voices who are lecturing us about our incivility and labeling what we are doing to be hatred. Yet they have not applied that label to Donald Trump and his supporters. 
When if anything, what we do, we do out of love for human beings, for our fellow human beings who are being abused by this administration. And yet we get applied the label hatred of hatred. When have they ever considered Donald Trump supporters to be hateful in the media? I remember when Hillary Clinton uh, called them deplorables and the media lost their minds. They're like, oh, 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 wait a minute. Well, you're going one step too far, Hillary Clinton. And now they have proven themselves to be nothing more than despicable, deplorable, uh, uh, subhuman beings. Because of how they hate other people, because how they will allow that hatred to become policy and how those policies irrevocably damage the lives of people across not only this country, but across this world. If you cannot tell the difference between our anger. About what this administration and his sycophants are doing to other human beings, if you can't tell the difference between that anger and the hatred that fuels. Their policies, the hatred towards brown people, towards black people, towards non-Christians, towards Muslims, the anger and the hatred that fuels what they are doing to actually hurt people. If you can't tell the difference between our anger and our attempt to stop their madness, then you clearly are a person who is a beneficiary of this power and you want to silence us because it is beneficial to you that you keep us worried about being civil while the world around us is being destroyed by their hatred. I'm on my shit today. We can't, I mean, the, the most, I, let me start here. The media knows what they're doing, period. But there are some people in liberal spaces and progressive spaces who are, cons, who are confused. And I'm not talking about the leadership of, of the Democratic Party, because I think they're either just completely feckless or they know exactly what they're doing or both, probably both. Those people like Chuck Schumer, who came out against Maxine Waters and distanced himself. People like like uh, uh, Cory Booker, who had the nerve to distance himself from Maxine Waters. Maxine Waters, if you want to buy into the framework of of gender norms and and toxic masculinity, then Maxine Waters is a the far greater man than than any of them. Either one of them would ever be. Side note, tangent, you know, it. I, I while I am personally moving away from gender norms and concern for about those things when i grew as i grew up you want to know who was the best example of a man that i ever saw in my life an old black woman but i mean the people the what i thought was manhood what i thought was a good example of a man the, and and my what i thought was a good example of a man was somebody who could stand up for what they believe, not mince words, not talk, not, not, not talk behind somebody's back, but say it to their face. You know, the type of person who will stand flat footed in front of a large crowd and say the unpopular thing. Or even if it was popular, they just said what they believe. The best example I saw growing up of a man was a grandmother, a black grandmother. And of course, this this plays out right now in real time as we see uh, people like Cory Booker talking about why we have to have a radical, a radical kind of law. No, my dude, right now we need a fight. We need to fight. And the person leading the charge in this fight is a 79 year old black grandmother. And we have leaders in the Democratic Party who are distancing th themselves from her. And while I believe the media knows exactly what they're doing, and I believe that the Democratic leadership knows exactly what they're doing, in addition to being feckless. I also believe that there are a lot of people, regular people who aren't in any position, just regular schmegular people or that you'll meet on the street who might actually be confused about the difference between anger and hatred, the difference between civility and incivility and how we are being held to the level and the standard of civility while Republicans can revel in their incivility. They can weaponize their incivility. They can weaponize their rage and beyond their rage, they can weaponize and create policy out of their hatred. But you want to lecture us about being civil? When, quite frankly, the only way we can stop this madness is within civility. Huh. 
And here we are. Here we are. We're we're engaged in this asymmetrical political warf- warfare where, where they are being held to a different standard than we are. And their standard that they're being held to. I mean, it, really think about it. Right? There, there's no limit to what they can get away with. Donald Trump violates the Constitution on a regular basis. Donald Trump attacks the media on a regular basis to worry about, you know, what we're held to. The, the, the free speech standard that we're held to is whether or not we will allow Nazis to go unchallenged. That that's literally what we are held to on the left. If we do not allow Nazis to have their speech unchallenged with our speech, then we're considered to be violators of first of the First Amendment. Meanwhile, Donald Trump himself is fr- the in the executive branch of the federal government is attacking the media, using his platform to attack the media. He is not doing so as a in, as a citizen. He's doing so as the president of the United States, a representative, the highest representative of our government. Asymmetrical warfare. We can never we can never gain ground. We can never win so long as we are locked in this warfare, this conflict that they have the ability to do anything and everything. And they have no standards that they are held to. They are free to run over this country, to violate the Constitution, to express their anger uninhibited, uh, uh, unencumbered with the concerns of civility. And yet we are held to the highest levels of civility, not only by them as a as a tool of control and a tool of a political warfare, but also by the ignorance. And the reckless civility of our leaders. Or your leaders and not my leaders, but they happen to be Democratic leaders. We can't. We've already lost. I was going to say we can't win, but we've already lost. And what this does in perpetuity, it it allows them to the, the conservatives to use their incivility to forever push us further and further and further to the right because of cowards like Chuck Schumer, who's like, oh, well, we just, you know, we, you know, we want to, you know, keep the peace. We want to be civil. Right. You know, maybe if we, you know, this is how you have the situation now where we're we're literally having conversations about whether or not we should give Donald Trump the wall. I think the guy's name is Andrew Sullivan, Sully Dish on Twitter. He's now making the argument. Of course, he's conservative, right? But he's a never Trump or conservative. He's making the argument that we should just give Donald Trump his wall as if a, 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 as a means of appeasing this monster, of uh, assuaging the hatred that's driving him. Of course, Andrew Sullivan didn't say that. I'm, I'm filling in the gaps because that's literally the core of his argument, that the way that we that we calm this 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 in civil moment, this moment of incivility, rather, uh, the way we calm it is by giving him the wall. This permanent monument to white supremacy, this fiscally irresponsible structure that is easily surmounted by a ladder that is one foot taller than the structure itself. That is now the solution. And the way we got to this place, as, re- as, as ridiculous as the notion of a border wall is, the way we got to this place is by Republicans and conservatives using their fury, their hatred, their anger, their anger that is driven and, and informed by their hatred. By them pushing the envelope on what they can get away with and moderates and people who are never Trumpers and people who are civility first. Being afraid of this moment and capitulating in this moment, acquiescing to the demands of terrorists. And this is why you cannot negotiate with terrorists because they are always going to ask for more. And if your starting position is with having regard for their incivility while trying to tame our incivility, then you are always in a position to move further and further and further into the direction that they want you to go in the first place. This is on purpose. This is not inci- this is not coincidental. This is intentional. They know exactly what they are doing. Conservatives know exactly what they are doing. They understand this asymmetrical fight. They understand like a spoiled child, the person who cries the loudest gets what they want in this environment. Meanwhile, we are being lectured by predominantly white liberals and moderates telling us that we need to be civil. While we can't even hold Donald Trump to the standard of of basic human decency or constitutionality. No, I will not be lectured. Neither should you allow anyone to lecture you on civility, not not at a time when we are dealing with a person who is most unreasonable ideologies that are most unreasonable.
Which brings me to the importance and the significance of anger. And why conservatives understand they part of their political calculus is how can they neutralize our anger while they weaponize their anger. I, I'm, I know I have somewhere in our, the catalog of these 616 episodes, I know that I have discussed this before, but I have to discuss it again. And we need to discuss it all the time, every day, apparently, because people don't get it. Anger is the most potent political tool. It is the thing that will make you get up and go vote in the rain. It is the thing that will make you get up and go vote in the snow, wherever it's snowing in November. It is the thing that will make you take time off when you don't have enough time to get off of work, when your job, when your boss is acting crazy. It is the thing that will drive you to the pole, come hell or high water. Your anger is the most powerful political tool and conservatives know this which is why they have created an propaganda infrastructure that is based on fueling their anger no matter what their circumstance they are currently in political power they have the white house they have the balance of power on the supreme court they have the house they have the senate they currently control 32 of 50 states both the le- both legislative chambers on the state level Republicans have media machines, media empires that that progressives and liberals can only dream of. Republicans and conservatives have all of the chips in this country, and yet they are still angry as though they are the oppressed. Because they understand the power of anger and they understand the power of the narrative of the oppressed. And so it is it was necessary for them to co-opt those things and to maintain them in their favor. This is why everything about conservatives is actually the victim complex. Right. While they are while they declare that that progressives and liberals are always the victim, Republicans have strategically made themselves to be the perpetual victim and to be to be perpetually angry. Because they understand the power of anger. This is not this is not coincidental. This is absolutely intentional. They understand that anger is the number, the only emotion that will make you surmount any obstacle, will make you overcome any difficulty to get to the poll and vote. Anger is the only way that you're going to get. If you're happy and everything is good and everything is fine, then you're more than likely to just forget about voting that day. Republicans, conservatives know this. That's why every facet of their of their propagandistic structure is about fueling anger. The opposite side of that approach, right? The 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 the, the subsequent or the logical next step in that strategy is to neutralize the anger of your opponent or to invalidate the anger of your opponent. I believe the last time I talked about this, I talked about this in term of in terms of why it's difficult for black people to be angry in this country where our, our anger is invalidated. Our, our anger is is used as a weapon against us. And they create the narrative of the angry black woman and the angry black man as a means of neutering, of neutralizing our anger, because they know if we are angry, we will get things done. If we're angry, we will mobilize. If we are angry, we will organize. If we are angry, we will get this system changed in no time flat. And so for years, for years, black people have had to try to appear as though we are never angry. Under no circumstances can we appear angry. We actually have to calculate. I literally have to calculate every word to ensure that I don't come off as the angry black man because this system is structured to invalidate my voice the moment I become angry. Yet and still you have people like Alex Jones. You have people like Rush Limbaugh who weaponize their anger. And yet here they are trying to neutralize me. Structurally, this system is designed to instantly invalidate me if I come off as an angry black man. And now we see that this is not just specific to black people, but it is specific to anyone who is challenging the power structure of this country. Anyone who challenges the power structure of white Christian men, you are not allowed to be angry. The system is terrified of your anger. Because your anger actually has the ability to tear down this power structure. And how do they stop that? 
They do so by trying to delegitimize your anger, by invalidating it, by making it seem that your anger is something to be feared when their anger is something to be respected. This is why you could have the entire Tea Party movement and no one ask any questions about civility. But yet when Maxine Waters, that 79 year old black grandmother, spoke and said that we need to challenge these people wherever we see them. We need to take them on anywhere we see them. Then all of a sudden the world is concerned about being civil. Or even 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 worse, in my opinion, this restaurant that put out Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Now, all of a sudden, everyone is like, oh, we're going. Oh, slow down. We're, we're going one. Uh, you're going one step, step too far. And it would seem as though the only people who are permitted to be angry in this country are those who acquiesce to power, who serve power, who benefit from that power. Sure, they could be angry. But the rest of us who are challenging power. Hmm. We must be civil and the slightest, the slightest hint. Oh, my God. The slightest hint of anger is instantly interpreted as hatred. It is so telling that you can't tell the difference between our righteous indignation to change these these abuses of these human rights abuses. You can't tell that our righteous indignation to stop the abuse of, of immigrants and asylum seekers by this administration. You can't tell the difference between our anger and their hatred, and you equate the two, it is so telling that that is your framework because you are now, you are have, and have been a beneficiary of this power structure. And you no more want us to change it than, than Republicans do. And that is why it is vitally important. It, it is critically necessary that we both understand the validity of and the power of our anger. And why we can never allow them to extinguish it. Most of all, extinguish it with our own fear of being perceived to be angry. We can't, we can't hold our tongues for fear that people are going to call us angry leftists or angry black people or angry women. We, we can't allow that. We can't psych ourselves out. We have to embrace our anger because our anger is righteous. The things that we are fighting for are correct, are right. If they are allowed to fight with the full force of their hatred towards immigrants, towards people of color, towards women, towards the LGBTQ community, towards Muslims, towards anyone who is not white Christian. If they are allowed to operate in this political sphere on the basis of that hatred, then surely we will. We don't need their permission. We are going to operate with our righteous indignation, our anger to stop them. And this is why it's critically important and like I said just a few moments ago, it's vitally necessary that we get leaders who understand this, that we get leaders who don't mince words. We get leaders who don't equivocate. We don't we get leaders who, who stop with this kumbaya bullshit. Because we're not at a moment you cannot. Oh God, I've said it so many times. I'm, I'll say it again. You cannot be reasonable with unreasonable people. You cannot be reasonable at unreasonable times. There are going to be. It's like my motto in my, in my bio. When you can be kind, of course, be kind. But when you can't take no prisoners. And, and the front line of much of this political discourse and this 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 fight is the political discourse, rather. Our discussions, our conversations, how we frame the arguments, how we frame the debates, what we allow, what, what we allow ourselves to be uh, corrected over, what we allow ourselves to be uh, censured by and for rather. That is the front front line of this of this argument, of this war, of this political war. We're not even talking about actual conflict. We're talking about rhetorical debates. We're talking about framings, the framing of the conversation. We're talking about the Overton window. And so at this stage, my God, we cannot handle, we can't afford to have leaders who are, who are cowards with their rhetoric. 
We can't have leaders who are so uh, addicted to this notion of, of civility that it becomes reckless civility. Shout out to Brandon Sutton, who gave us gave us that phrase like three years ago or whenever I first met him. He was the one who identified that reckless uh, Brandon Sutton of the discourse. Um, go check out his podcast. He's part of the progressive army. That was his phrase. And it stuck with me. And now it's like now is the moment where you have to identify that this reckless civility that came from uh, from people like Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi and 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 uh, the one that infuriated me the most, uh, Cory Booker. Cory Booker distancing himself from from Maxine Waters after all of that grandstanding that he did, all of that contrived anger that he tried to show, you know, you know people who try to work themselves up to being angry. You're not you're not genuinely angry, but you have to show and pretend like you're angry right now. So he put on a nice show at the Senate hearing at several Senate hearings. And now he wants to dis distance himself from Maxine Waters because he doesn't believe that she was operating in love and he he believes in a radical kind of love that those the, those are the last leaders that we ever need from those are the people that we need to avoid like the plague because if you if they can't handle this rhetorical framing this 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 discourse are are in, they, if they can't be uh if they're worried about civility in this discourse how in the world would they ever go against Donald Trump in an actual debate? How would they go against this man who is the quintessential example of incivility? This man who, who, quite frankly, his supporters love him because of his incivility. Dear God, why are we even discussing this when we know without a doubt the very thing that they love about Donald Trump is his incivility? We're playing an asymmetric, we're fighting an asymmetrical political war where now they're on their end. It is quite literally the goal for them to be politically incorrect. And yet they want to hand hold us to the level of being civil. So back to the point, the point is that we absolutely do not have time for leaders who would cower in this moment, who would capitulate to the demands of terrorists, who, if nothing more, rhetorical terrorists, and in, in terms of what they're accomplishing, they are terrorizing communities. How could you even, how could you even con concern your mind with the worry of how they perceive your actions, of the, how they perceive your anger? You know why? Because we've we've been like this. I mean, they have taken advantage of the the hearts of good men, of good women, of, the, of our goodwill. They manipulate our goodwill against us. They manipulate our desire to be bigger than them, our desire to be better, our desire to be more human, our desire to uh, uh, to to ascend to higher heights of humanity. They manipulate that against us. And that's why it is always vitally necessary and critically essential. Yes, that's my catchphrase for the day. It is so important that we always be able to turn on a dime from our, our, our pursuit of a greater humanity to our willingness to fight like hell to defend it. If you cannot turn on a dime, then you are not equipped for today. You're not equipped for the world that we live in. You're not equipped for the future. There will always be people who will manipulate our good intentions, always be people who would try to manipulate our tolerance to insert their intolerance in our society. And that's why we have to be able to turn on a dime. And see a threat for what it is and treat that threat with the full force of our righteous indignation and our valid anger. And then when that threat is gone, then by all means, return to a moment of civility and, a, and, a, and, a, and an elevated discourse. But we are not in that moment. The moment that we are in right now is a moment of 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 great hostility of 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 of, of it is a treacherous time. The president of the United States is demonstrating his willingness, not only him, but his supporters are demonstrating their willingness to allow him to violate the Constitution, literally. In order to carry out policies that are fueled and informed by their hatred of people 
who do not comport neatly into their culture. People who don't either serve white supremacy or benefit from white supremacy, white male supremacy. We have to be able to turn on our dime and we cannot afford leadership who do not understand that when you can be kind, yes, be kind. But when you can't, take no prisoners. That's all the time I have for you today. Thanks so much for hanging out with me. As always, it is a pleasure. Go to patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and become a patron today. Help support the Benjamin Dixon show and all of our endeavors. That's it, folks. I will see you next time. Take care. Bye bye. The Benjamin Dixon show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the progressive army.